Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. What were the main findings of this report? Well, I think the main takeaway is that even though the Chinese Communist Party has in some ways influenced the media that we all consume in one way or another, over the past decade, the ability and the dedication and the resources that Chinese officials have put into affecting the media and the content and the narratives that spread about China in particular to other parts of the world has increased quite dramatically. And that even over just the past three years, we've seen even greater intensification of that dynamic and the emergence of new tactics and especially a, a new kind of brazenness, even in terms of some of the ways in which you know, Chinese officials uh, engage on social media platforms like Twitter, uh, the way in which we're seeing more dis Russia style disinformation um, and just surely the scale um, of the content and the reach of Chinese state media narratives. Uh, it, it's pretty it's pretty impressive and it's a little shocking, I think, if you haven't really looked at this. And so the reality is that now you have a situation where it's not only over a billion people in China who are consuming news from tightly Chinese government and Communist Party controlled outlets. Um, you actually have hundreds of millions of people around the world in multiple languages consuming that content. Um, often in a way in which um, the origins are obscured, so they might not actually even know that the news and the information they're um, engaging with uh, is coming from the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. The report made some recommendations. Will we see these being taken up by countries concerned about the CCP's growing influence? Actually, we're already seeing them, though I can't you know, be taken up, though I can't fully take, take credit for it. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we've seen also in the last few years is greater awareness um, and pushback vis-a-vis uh, -vis Beijing's media influence on media environments in other countries. Um, and, and so some of the things you know that we recommended uh, were, for example, more transparency. And we're seeing that both on the government side uh, in terms of uh, more registrations under the Foreign Agents Registration Act in the U.S., uh, the foreign influence laws that we've seen have, um, in, be passed in Australia, uh, technology firms starting to put labels on media outlets saying that this is state media from, from, from China, among other, other outlets. So I think that's one of the things that we've seen starting to happen more and more. Um, another, it relates to regulation. And we're seeing more examples of real enforcement of some of the laws that are supposed to um, uh, supervise uh, Chinese uh, state media and, and also tech companies that influence the local infrastructure. Um, and so we're seeing that not only places like the U.S. where there have been a number of designations, but in the U.K. Um, just in the last week, we saw the main regulator there uh, find that CGTN, which is the international arm of China State Broadcaster, uh, actually, um, they found that they had violated the broadcasting rules in the U.K. when they had aired televised confessions of political and, and financial prisoners uh, in China. And so now CGTN there faces, we don't yet, I don't think know what the penalties will be, but it could be fines, it could be a loss of license. So I think that's one of the things, there are actually in a lot of countries laws on the books uh, that would help regulate this space appropriately in a way that balances freedom of expression, but still you know, keeps a handle on the more uh, covert, coercive uh, or corrupting elements of, of Chinese media influence, which I think is really what's you know, the fundamental underlying concern here. The Trump administration recently introduced measures for the Chinese state media operating in the US. Do you think these measures will have much effect? Um, I think we'll have to see. There are certain ways in which we're not quite sure yet how this will exactly play out. Uh, one way in which we do see it having an effect is in the realm of transparency, because basically it makes very clear to any American, including a lot of local governors or local state officials, that the Chinese government, especially when U.S.-China relations at the federal level are so rocky right now, they've really been going down to the more local level. So it sends a clear signal that these are Chinese state-run uh, outlets, that these are arms of uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. And that actually is an accurate reflection because uh, Xi Jinping himself has visited the headquarters of these outlets and said that they should be surnamed party, so to speak, and tell China's story well. But in that context, often China means the Communist Party's story well. Um, so I think that's one of the main things is that it really will, you know, increases transparency. It also increases transparency for 
um, I would say the State Department itself and being able to see what these outlets are doing. Um, and I think concerns over some reporters maybe being used uh, more in like an intelligence gathering capacity than actual real reporting. Um, so I, I think those are some of the things. Um, but one of the other things we've seen is more is, is more serious um, enforcement of the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which, again, fundamentally is about transparency. Um, and so actually the latest um, submission by China Daily, which is the main English language state run media that is really disseminated all over the world, uh, including an insert in mainstream U.S. media, um, which is actually one of the ways they reach probably what some of their largest U.S. audience, because. Not many people are going to walk down the streets of New York and, and pay some money and take it out of one of the newspaper boxes there. Um, and, and so the latest filing actually has quite a bit more detail in terms of uh, how many millions of dollars, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, have been paid uh, to particular news outlets in the United States in order to run uh, these paid supplements. So I, I think that's an important element of, of some of the measures that the U.S. government has taken. Your report states that China is showing a readiness to meddle in the internal political debates and electoral contests of other countries. Now, what countries have you found that have experienced this meddling by China? Well, Taiwan is, of course, ground zero for that. Um, and I think that's one of the places where we've seen, and Hong Kong also, um, you know, where we've seen kind of the testing grounds. Uh, particularly for these more Russia style type of uh, disinformation campaigns, because, you know, traditionally and up until 2017, I would be or 2018, I'd be on panels with people who were talking about, say, Russian influence in the U.S. election. I'd be like, China doesn't really do that. The way in which the Chinese Communist Party tries has traditionally tries to influence media uh, is much more through propaganda and through various forms of intimidation uh, and censorship, even of media outlets outside of China. Uh, but this, you know, tw this um, expansion uh, to kind of using Twitter bots, using lots of trolls. Actually, a lot of the manipulation is happening by actual real people in China, um, government officials. It's not really quite, quite clear exactly who all of these people are, but it's not necessarily all automated the way you might see from Russia or some other countries. Um, and so Taiwan has really been ground zero for that. And um, I think the first time this came up was with regards to local elections. Um, in November 2018, and there was a contest in one city uh, in southern China, and actually the quite populist and, and pro-Beijing candidate uh, won, so very, very surprisingly. And it was really, there were, there were some Facebook groups and other forms of influence uh, that was a manipulation of Google search results uh, that was really traced back to different provinces in China after the fact. Um, and then we saw ahead of the January 2020 general elections and presidential elections in Taiwan, I would say that both the Taiwanese government and Taiwanese civil society and also international tech firms like Facebook were much more, were really on high alert. And so it seems that whatever the efforts were that the Chinese government tried to engage in um, or various other Chinese state actors uh, re really wasn't successful and, and the incumbent uh, who's disfavored by Beijing uh, still, still won the election by quite a wide margin. You have a, uh, some elections happening for those who have been in caves. It happens in November, end of uh, this year. Uh, can you see the Chinese increasing their activity in the U.S.? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think there have been a number of examples of um, efforts that, you know, could affect campaigns or just affect the general um, political situation in the U.S. Uh, two examples. One, some of this is done by hacking. So there was a reports of China-based hacking, um, attempting to target Joe Biden's campaign. Um, there was also this very disconcerting example uh, in March that actually the content itself didn't have anything to do with China. It was related to the, corona the emerging coronavirus pandemic. And it was an effort to amplify basically fake uh, SMS messages, text messages in particular, uh, that were talking about a top-down nationwide lockdown and military enforcement, really like actual real fake and false news. Um, and apparently was amplified by 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 Twitter bots um, and by by bots and other mechanisms, not Twitter necessarily, because it was text messages. But apparently that were traced back to China in a way that was meant to really sow panic in the U.S. Um, and, and to undermine kind of government, uh, you know, trust in the government. And so I think rather than seeing a situation where it might be that Chinese um, linked activity favors a particular candidate in an election, I think it might be more that the kinds of activity we see is amplifying divisive messages, amplifying hashtags. We've seen a little bit of that in the aftermath of, 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 of George Floyd's death. Um, 
And um, it, so I, I think it's more likely to be of that nature uh, in, in terms of trying to just amplify existing division, sow confusion, as opposed to what we saw in Taiwan, where it, it really is Beijing has you know very specific reasons why uh, it favored one candidate over another. China is abusing social media, but aren't companies such as Facebook and Twitter enabling it and reaping financial rewards? Are these U.S. companies then doing enough to mitigate these influences? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say they're doing more and more, and I think they've gotten better. Um, a lot of what we actually know, especially about Chinese um, linked uh, Twitter bot campaigns, Facebook manipulations, YouTube manipulation, is actually because Twitter in particular um, has gone quite public um, with with some of the campaigns trying to smear Hong Kong protesters last summer and actually release the data. And then that enables investigative journalists. There's actually a think tank in Australia, the Australian um, um, Policy and Strategic Institute, ASPE, Strategic Policy Institute, um, that's done some really great analysis on this using data that, that Twitter has made public. Um, and, and I think we're seeing more and more uh, reactions. Uh, Twitter has now uh, stopped taking ad money, actually, from state media, not only Chinese, but also other governments that have tightly controlled and not editorially independent a state-funded media. Uh, Facebook has started labeling them. Um, I think they've started discussing, uh, is, you know, ending some of the ads and so forth. So, um, so I think, you know, there was a gap. I think the companies are uh, taking more action. Uh, is there more that they can do? Probably. Um, but, but there's definitely a much more robust response now uh, than there was even just two years ago. TikTok. Who would ever think TikTok would be a uh a concern for security organizations, but it is. India has banned it. What's your thoughts on TikTok? Should it be banned? Um, well, I would say I think it's very problematic, especially in a democratic and um, in the United States context, uh, to completely ban uh, an app like that. In fact, I think it's probably unconstitutional. That being said, there are very valid security concerns regarding TikTok. And I haven't seen a fully rigorous independent audit of the app, but there have been these kind of inklings um, by various techies who have looked at it or analyzed it. And the main concern isn't so much about uh, the content uh, as much as how much information it's able to access on your phone. And that there may be ways in which it's accessing information on the phone that aren't actually really so relevant to the kind of app that it is and stand out even relative to other social media apps that we know collect a lot of information from our devices. So my suspicion, especially when you're seeing these kinds of debates coming up now in India, in Australia, in the United States, as well as in other countries, is that it might be a case where the intelligence agencies maybe know something we don't know and they haven't made public. Um, that being said, again, I think a wholesale ban is, is problematic, but there are other things that can be done. We've seen countries take this measure, not only with Tic Tac, but with WeChat, which is an instant messaging system that is um, owned and operated by Tencent, another big uh, Chinese tech company. Um, and that is to limit uh, the ability of it being downloaded on government-issued phones, uh, on phones of people who have access to confidential information, maybe security clearance above a certain level. So I think that's one aspect. The other is that in the U.S. especially, um, we could use better data protection laws generally. Mm -hmm. And so improving that would definitely improve, you know, fix a loophole with regards uh, to TikTok, uh, to TikTok as well. Um, there's probably more that can be done. But again, I think there are very valid concerns in terms of kind of the, the security and privacy implications, and also in terms of the content manipulation. It seems over the last year, even just as TikTok has come under more scrutiny, that there may have been changes in its moderation policies uh, in a positive direction after it was kind of caught and some moderation policies were leaked that indicated that they were downplaying or even deleting uh, videos about sensitive topics, whether it was the Hong Kong protests, uh, the Falun Gong uh, spiritual practice that's banned and persecuted in China. Um, so I, I think there's still actually a lot we just don't know about TikTok. There's definitely more testing that needs to be done. And, and I think thoughtful policy debate about how you balance uh, the choice of consumers, inform the consumers about the risks, um, and, and respect their freedom of expression, uh, but also, you know, I would say both protect their rights as individuals and also protect the national security concerns and the primary information 
uh, that a lot of uh, governments are worried could ha fall into the hands of Beijing. Uh, my fear is that uh, TikTok, WeChat, uh, Zoom, uh, all got apps. If you've got an app, they can backdoor you. And if you can backdoor the, the user, you can backdoor anybody you want. So maybe that's the, uh, the concern there too. Yeah, that absolutely is it. It's exactly that, that there's, there's a backdoor. And look, it's a valid concern not only with regard to these apps, but because we've seen a, lot, a number of other apps within China, uh, including ones that were designed by uh, other big tech companies like Alibaba, that were meant to be for one purpose and turned out to have another backdoor. Mm. And the classic example is some people might, you might have heard about, there's this like Xi Jinping kind of propaganda and thought um, study app. Uh, that was released um, about about a year ago, I think, mm -hmm. maybe a little more, and um, and it was downloaded tens of millions of times. To be honest, mostly because people were required and had all these games and quizzes and things like that, so you could earn points. But people who are working for the state, whether they're, um, you know, including like civil servants, teachers, were required to engage on it. Um, an analysis that was later done found it had a major backdoor onto people's phones. Um, so I, I think again, I think there are valid um, reasons uh, why. I think the question is whether banning the app is the right thing to do, whether there are other major measures that could be done to uh, push the companies uh, to comply, uh, to, to close those kinds of loopholes. Um, because I think, I do think at least in the U.S. context, uh, you know, banning an app like that could run into First Amendment legal problems. Just to quickly tell us about Freedom House, your aims and goals. Sure. So Freedom House, um, we're actually one of the oldest human rights organizations in the United States. We were founded back in 1941. And our, our goal is really to promote freedom uh, and democracy in different parts of the world uh, through various forms of, of research, of advocacy, and of also in some cases working with and helping uh, activists that are on the front lines of, of the fight for freedom uh, and human and really basic human rights. Um, around the world. And so and so that's what we do. And um, I direct a particular publication called the China Media Bulletin um, that really monitors these kinds of topics, both within China and outside of China. And it's free. So if you go to our website at freedomhouse.org, you can just add your email and get it in your inbox and um, and keep up to date with, you know, th it's really a constantly changing uh, situation. And uh, it keeps me very, very busy, unfortunately. But it keeps you out of mischief too and stops you from using TikTok and dancing and singing. <laughs> right. I don't waste time on TikTok. That's true. Sarah, look, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.